Um, let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us here together on this beautiful Sunday. Um, we thank you for your grace and your, for, for your goodness. Lord, I just want to pray for the junior high students as they finish their retreat. I pray that you would really just bless the time that they have with one another as well as um, the family worship that they're also about to be a part of. Um, Lord, I just want to pray for our high school students um, coming off of retreat. Lord, I pray that we would continue um, what we learned there, um, the relationships we made there, and the commitments we made um, to battle our sin at retreat. I pray that we would continue continue to battle that here as well, Lord, in knowing that really just the God we served up at retreat is the same exact God that we worship down here. Lord, I pray that we would rest in that. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen. Okay, so we're going to start in Exodus 19. So if you want to turn there, um, I'm not going to read the whole thing um, for time's sake because we ran out of time last service. So I'm going to just read an, a part of it. So, um, so the last time we left off, um, we learned that obviously God had brought his people, the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. Um, they came into the desert and then they started to complain because they didn't have any food. So God, um, destroyed them and then he brought up a new people. No, God provided, um, food for them. He provided manna, quail, and water. Um, and so God in his grace and his mercy provided for his people despite their complaints. And so now we are in Exodus 19, and this is a setup for Exodus chapter 20, which is on the Ten Commandments. Um, and so Exodus 19 is setting up for exactly why we have the Ten Commandments. And so we're going to look at verses 3 through 6, if you can just follow along with me. It says, well, while Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So this particular part, um, portion of Exodus chapter 19, God is calling his people to be set apart. And so if you were at high school retreat, we learned that God is holy, and that means God is set apart from us. He is different from us. He thinks differently from us. Um, he is not the same in the way that we act. He's completely different because he's set apart because he's holy. And because of that, God calls also his people to be holy. So in this particular portion, he's telling his people, because I have brought you out of Egypt, because I have rescued you, I'm now calling you to live a holy life. And that is why I'm about to give you these 10 commandments, um, to live your life in the way I would like you to. Because up until this point, the Israelites have been in Egypt and they have been under Egyptian rule. And we know that the Egyptian culture is very brutal um, in terms of the way that they live. We saw that at the beginning of Exodus, they enslaved the Israelites. No one raised a question about it, said maybe this is wrong. And then later we learned that Pharaoh is threatened. So because he's threatened, he says and commands his people to kill Israelite children. And no one had a problem with that either. And so we have to question that there's something very wrong with this culture. And not just Egypt, but other cultures during that time were also very brutal. So God wants his people to be a light in the midst of these brutal cultures and show that this is the best way of living. This way leads to life. And so God is calling his people to be holy um, in this setup for Exodus chapter 20. And not only that, but if we, I'm not going to read it, but if we go later, if you skim through Exodus chapter 19, you see that God is coming upon Mount Sinai and there's this whole ordeal. Um, there's thunder, lightning, clouds, smoke, and that just shows God's holiness, God's greatness, that he doesn't come down in this flowery meadow of silence and peace, but God is powerful. He's holy. He's set apart, and then he asks his people to consecrate, to clean themselves before they're even to be able to approach the mountain, saying that you need to prepare yourself before you're able to approach me. You can't come just on your own. And we see that parallel in the gospel in us as well, that we're not able to have a relationship with God, but because of Christ, because of a mediator, we're now able to have a relationship with God. So that's the little parallel um, in Exodus chapter 19, which sets us up for Exodus chapter 20. So if you want to turn to Exodus 20, um, we're going to skip over to 20. 
Um, and I'll be going through verses 1 through 11, and then Jason Teacher will be finishing it off. So um, let's start in verse 1. We are, make sure I'm on time. Um, so verse 1, and God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And when we're reading this, we don't, I think, before I skipped over this part because I'm so stuck on let's get to the Ten Commandments that I don't think this particular, these two verses are very important. Um, But what's really essential about verse two is before God gives his law to the people, he tells them who he is. He says, I am the Lord, your God. So he tells them that he is a personal God, that I'm not just some guy who showed up today to give you this law, but he is a God who brought them out from Egypt, who's a personal God he rescued them and he's saying because of that now I'm giving you my law so God is not separate he is not some puppet master he is a personal God um, and he causes people to be holy and the people who are about to receive this law the Israelites um, as we know they didn't do anything to be saved like to be rescued Um, God didn't tell them I'm you have to be obedient to me you have to follow me in these ways and then I'll rescue you but rather God rescues them first in his grace, in his mercy, um, despite them not doing anything, not following him. And then now he asks his people in response to their salvation to be obedient to him. And likewise for us, um, God does not require our obedience for our salvation, but rather because we are saved, now we obey God. Um, Pastor Kevin DeYoung says, we need to hear it again. Salvation is not the reward for obedience. Salvation is the reason for obedience. So we need to make sure we don't get this confused in the fact that it is not required for you. You don't get salvation because you're a good person, but rather salvation is the reason for your obedience. You obey because now you have received salvation. Um, And that is what's happening here. Um, God rescues his people from Egypt, and now he asks them for um, their obedience. So um, we're going to get into the law itself. And before we go into the Ten Commandments, I want us to consider a little bit um, about law. Um, because the Ten Commandments is very common to us. But I want us to think um, in our heads, not out loud, um, if we can list all Ten Commandments. Um, just a little bit. I feel like when I was younger, um, they had us memorize it more. But as we get older and older, I feel like um, it's not as emphasized or pushed. Um, But I want to make a case that God's law is very beautiful and it leads to life for us. It's good for us, despite us thinking that it makes us restricted. So let's think about, um, as an illustration, traffic law. So how many of you guys drive? Maybe not very many. Just the seniors, basically. But um, we know that when we drive on a highway, usually it's 65 miles per hour. But we know that if you go 65 miles per hour, um, you're going to get cut off. You know, people are going to honk at you. And so usually people go break the law and go 70 or 75. Um, If it's dark at night and you don't think you'll get caught, you go 80 or 85. Don't do that. I'm just saying people do it. Um, Don't do that going forward. I didn't teach you that. Um, So traffic laws are in place for our safety, but we break it because of why. Usually when I go, I'm not saying I go like 80 or 85, but when after service um, on Fridays, because it's late at night, I really, I'm tired. So I want to go home. So I go a little fast. I'm not going to I don't go like really fast, but I go a little bit faster than like when I come up because I want to go home and I want to go to sleep. Or let's say you're already late, so you go extra fast so that you're not late. Or let's say you need to use the bathroom really bad, so you push the gas so you can get home and use the bathroom. So we break the law because it's convenient for our agenda. Does that make sense? So we break it because we have an agenda. We want to get somewhere. We need to do something. So we break the law. Um... But in fact, that the law is in place for our safety. So if we think about like stoplights, think about a world of driving without stoplights. Would you even drive? Stops, I'm saying like stoplights, stop signs. Would you go out drive because you think it's safe? I don't think I would drive because, you know, drivers are selfish. Um, they do offensive driving, not defensive dri- driving. So they want to go first. So that's going to cause a lot of collision. But we know that the law is there in place for our safety so that people don't get into accidents. And similarly, 
We break God's law often, not because we don't know it's there, but because we don't want to follow it. As in, that's our sinful heart saying, I want to rebel against God because it's inconvenient to my life. It's not normal. Other people think I'm weird because of it. You know, we have our own agenda that we want to push. But when we look at it, God's law is, God knows already what's good for you, what's good for our lives. And he presents it to us through his law because he knows that these boundaries are good for us and that through the boundaries, there's freedom because we're able to live fully and live life fully. So that's why we have the law. So I want us to consider a little bit that law is beautiful. God's law is beautiful. It's not restricting, but it leads to a life fully lived in God. So we're going to go into verse 3. I'm not going to go too in-depth because I know that we know the Ten Commandments. So um, verse 3 says, you shall have no other gods before me, which is really simple. I think that if we think about it, when people ask, um, do you follow this commandment? We would probably say yes. Like, I only have God. I don't have any other gods. You know, I don't worship Buddha or, you know, Joseph Smith. But I want us to think about this a little bit differently in the fact that there's always an and for us, as in, I worship God and this. I still worship God, it's just I have this too. So I worship God and money. But we think, we, I think that we, what's the right word I'm looking for? We think that it's okay because we still worship God and not realize that there's an and after that. So consider this il- illustration. Think of a man who comes home to his wife and he brings another woman with him and he goes up to his wife and he says, Honey, I brought this new woman home. You still get to be my wife, but sometimes I'm going to spend time with this other woman. What do you think the wife would say? Oh, honey, that sounds great. Thank you so much for considering me, you know, letting me to, you know, allowing me to still be your wife. No, you would say she's crazy if she says something like that. She would probably say, like, pick me or pick her. You can't be with me if you're going to be with her. And if she's going to stick around, I'm leaving. So in the same way, God is saying that what it means to have there's no other God before me, that there shouldn't be an and. God asks for our full commitment. And when we say we love God, we only love God. That's our commitment. That's our loyalty to him. And he establishes that as his first commandment for the commandments to follow, that God wants to ask for our loyalty, for our commitment. And so let's move on to the second commandment. Um, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So this one too, I feel like when people ask, do you follow this commandment? You're like, oh, I don't have like statues of like other gods and things like that in my room, but um, the heart behind this commandment is that it's wrong worship, as in God is saying, don't limit me to an image, because we learned at retreat that God is set apart, God is holy, he's completely different from us, and it's wrong of us to limit God in an image, but he can't be contained within an image. So you may have the right heart in the sense that like this reminds me of God, In the sense that like, oh, like this reminds me of God, so I'm going to pray more or I'm going to whatever. But the sense that you're limiting God to a man-made thing is saying that you're, we don't truly understand who God is then. We can't worship him properly if we don't, if we're limiting him to an image. And ultimately, we don't even need an image because when Christ came down, he was the image of God. And he's our example. And so we don't need those um, idols anymore. Okay, verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Um, I think we have to think about this a little more. I mean, growing up, my parents would get really upset at me if I said something like, oh, my God. Um, I don't know how it is now, like, if your parents get upset at you if you use the G-O-D word and oh, my God. Um, or if you say things like, I don't know if I'm allowed to, like, You get upset, so you say, like, Jesus Christ. I'm not saying, like, 
I'm not saying it, I'm just saying it as an example. You know, I don't actually use this kind of language, but I'm just saying it as an example. Um, that I feel like when I was growing up, like this was completely, ups like people would get really upset, like you can't use that kind of language. Um, but I think there's a different heart behind this as well, in the sense of like, of course you shouldn't be using God's name, like oh my God, or Jesus Christ, because we have to realize that when we say that, we're misusing the name in the sense that God's name is to be revered and to be awed at. It's the name that people call on to be saved. It's when he reveals himself to his people, he says, tell them I am who I am. There's power in God's name, and for us to misuse that is saying that we can just throw around something that's ultimately so powerful. Does that make sense? Can I get like a nod? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then I think another way that we can break this commandment is if we claim um, to be Christians, to be people who um, are living for this name, but we don't live for the name. Does that make sense? So we label ourselves as Christians, we use this name, but we don't live our lives as Christians. And so in turn, we misuse this, we misrepresent it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so let's quickly go down. Um, I want to settle a little bit on verse 8, the fourth commandment. Um, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, um, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Um, so the Israelites up until this point were slaves. And we know that slaves just do whatever the master says. You know, they're constantly exploited. They're overworked. Um, we saw that. Um, when Pharaoh got angry, he made them make bricks in a harder way. So it took them even longer to do the task that they were asked to do. And so God commands this day of rest for his people. He says, you're going to work six days, but this day is dedicated to me so that you're able to rest, you're able to take a break. Um, and the Hebrew word for Sabbath actually means ceasing. So they're ceasing work. Um, and I think a little bit for us, for us to kind of rest on this um, as I close my portion is, um, I think we're constantly moving. We're always doing something. We always feel like we have to do something. Um, even at the junior high retreat, I was kind of shocked um, by the language that some of the students were using in terms of they say that they were telling me their schedule. And then I asked them, do you have any free time? And they're 12 years old, you know. Like, I was thinking about what I did at 12 years old. Like, I didn't study that much, you know, I was doing 12-year-old things, but these students don't have any, our students don't have any free time at 12 years old, they can't be a middle schooler, and I thought about you guys as well, thinking that if the 12-year-olds, if our 7th and 8th graders are this busy, how much more busy are our high school students, and um, just thinking about rest and what that means for us, I feel like we're constantly told to keep moving, keep doing things. Um, but I want us to be able to find rest in Christ in the sense that Christ has already done the work for us and there's nothing that we have to do. There's nothing that's required for us anymore. Um, so I'm going to ask us to close our eyes a little bit. Not a little bit. Close our eyes for a little bit um, and reflect on this a little bit. Um, what rest means to us, what ceasing means to us, um, because I think God did create us to be workers because he created, he was a workman the first six days, and then he had the seventh day as rest, and I think that it's a call, it's a command for us to be able to rest, and now we're able to fully rest because Christ has already finished the work for us on the cross, um, so reflect on that a little bit. Um, what that means for you. So, Lord, we come before you and we ask for your help. 
because we live such busy lives, such demanding lives, that we often only have opportunities to relax, not rest. And so, Lord, we come before you, you who are, who is the Prince of Peace, and we ask for your help. We ask for your perfect peace in this time, in this life of busyness. Would you be with us in your name? Pray. Amen. All right. And so, Sherry Teacher uh, graciously shared with us the fact that these commandments were given to us not for our salvation because following these commandments do not merit our salvation, but rather we follow these commandments because of our salvation. And so now as we're diving deeper into the rest of the commandments, we'll see that the first four are actually our relationship vertically with God and the rest are our horizontal relationship with one another. And so I'm hoping that as we dive deeper into each commandment um, that you'll kind of see the depth that the God that the God that our God is trying to show you. And so starting off with the fifth commandment in verse 12, it says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your, your God is giving you. Now, it's the commandment that we all know, but we often have quite the hard time following, mainly because it's our parents. And so, but I want to point out the fact that this commandment is first because it lays down the foundation for the rest of the other commandments. And so it's not surprising that this commandment is first because it shows how important our relationship with our parents is. And so if you um, kind of think about it, our parents, our relationship with our parents is the foundation for the basis of all our other relationships. So whether it be with our friends, whether it be with our teachers, whether it be with relatives or just people you don't know, we base our relationships with those people primarily first by having a relationship with our parents. Because it's from our parents that we have experience with an authority above our head. So having to do things that we may not want to do, having to um, listen to them even though we may not want to. Why? Because we're honoring the fact that they are above us in authority. Um, and so um, parents are such a big deal in God's plan that it says this in Deuteronomy 21 about rebellious children. Verse 18, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives. Verse 20, and they shall say to the elders of his city, this is our son. This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. And so, based upon reading this, and if you think about the story of the prodigal son, that makes the story of the prodigal son outrageous. Because if you're not familiar with the story, the prodigal son basically tells his dad, hey, dad, I want half of your stuff, and so can you just basically act dead? I'll take your stuff, and then I'm going to go live my life. So he's basically saying, I don't need you in my life. I just want your money. So he does that, takes that, and he goes off into the world. He parties. He experiences the world to the full, and ultimately he finds out that the world has nothing good to offer. And so what does he do? He ends up returning to his father, hoping that he'll take him back, not as his son, but as a servant so that he can work in his father's house. But the crazy thing is, if you know the story, is that the father does what? He embraces him and he restores him as his son, a part of the family. And so this is exactly what Christ does for us. Christ redeems us from our sin, the fact that we were due death, but he restores us by dying on the cross for us, giving us salvation, restoring us into his family. And so Pastor Kevin DeYoung he says something I thought was really profound about Jesus and his obedience to his parents. He explains, even Jesus obeyed his parents, and he was perfect, and they were not. If you ever have a moment where you think, I know so much more than my parents. In fact, I feel like I'm living a better life, or living life much better than my parents. I'm much closer to perfection than my parents. Congratulations, you're a lot like Jesus, and Jesus never disobeyed his parents. 
So the idea is, if you think about who Jesus is, yes, Jesus was 100% man, but again, he was 100% God. And so he was perfect. And so in his perfection, he had to submit under his mom, who is imperfect. And so if you kind of think about that, that kind of blows your mind. It's kind of like, wait, if it's hard for me as an imperfect son or daughter to follow and honor my imperfect mom and dad, then think about someone who is perfect, who is justified by saying, well, I'm perfect and you're not, so I don't really have to listen to you. But he honors them by honoring God through his obedience to them. And so to me, that was mind-blowing. Like that concept is like, wow, how much obedience do you have to have? How much humility do you have to have to do that? So just something to think about. Um, Let's move on to the next commandment. Uh, in verse 13, the sixth commandment is to not murder. But as, um, as we're diving into each commandment, remember, we're going into the horizontal aspect of each commandment. And so we're going to dive deeper into them. So just this, is, this isn't just talking about murder in the sense of like, don't take someone's life. But the fact that taking a life is wrong because we have, each of us have the imago Dei, the image of God, even if we don't believe in Christ. And so that's why for us, abortion, things like that is so crucial to us, so um, something that we care about because it's about the taking of a life, but not only that, taking of a life that can't speak up for itself. And so when we think about things like that, there's something surprising that I also learned as I was kind of preparing for this that also fits in with this. And it's the, the idea of suicide. Um, I know this is a little bit of a topic touchy subject, but I just wanted to address it because I know that the amount of pressure and stress that you guys deal with is so immense. And I honestly admit, as one of your leaders, I'm not equipped to help you through that, and I'm sorry for that, but I do want to say that if you guys truly are struggling with stuff like this, then I ask you, I plead with you to seek professional help that will help you through this because don't just struggle with this by yourself. Please, please find people, please find counselors and doctors who are professionally trained to help you through this. And I want to make something very, very clear. God doesn't put you in a situation where the only option for you is suicide. God doesn't push you and push you and push you and push you to the point where you're like, oh, I can't do this anymore. What can I do to escape this? And the only thought that you have, the only option that you have is suicide. God doesn't do that. We see that in the entirety of the Bible. The fact that God chose you. God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to die on the cross for you. He desperately fights for you every single day. Matter of fact, Jesus intercedes to the Father on your behalf. Because to him, to God, you're worth it. You're irreplaceable. You're invaluable. And to him... He loves you so much unconditionally that he chooses you. He knows you by name. And we know that famous phrase in the Bible where he can count the hairs on your head. And so I just wanted to encourage you, those that are struggling just with just pressure and anxiety, know that God is there for you. God is with you. And just briefly as we kind of wrap up this commandment, in Matthew 5, Jesus talks about anger. And the fact that anger is basically counted the same as murder. And so if you are um, just not in the rightful terms with people, either whether, whether it be that you have wronged someone or that someone has wronged you, Jesus says to reconcile with one another. Otherwise, it, it's basically seen the same, same level as murder. And so, um, yeah, just wrapping up there. Uh, The seventh commandment is to not commit adultery. Um, Again, it's not just adultery, but for us, I think if we dive a little deeper, it's the idea that for us, we have this order that God has set in the standard of biblical marriage. And so in Genesis, we see that biblical marriage is between man and woman. And it's it's so that because man and woman can only complement each other. It can't be man and man. It can't be woman and woman. It can't be anything other than that. And so when we seek relationships, when we seek things outside of what God's structure of biblical marriage is, then we're admitting 
and saying, look, my feelings, my heart, my desires, my pleasures are above God's perfect order. It's saying, whatever God's standard of marriage is, I don't care about that. And I know better than God, and so I'm just going to follow and pursue my physical desires, my selfish relationships. And so when we think about adultery, for us, I think it's best that we think about, not in the sense of like cheating, which is definitely wrong as well, but the fact for us, I think, it's in the context of marriage. And so if we look a little deeper than that, it's ultimately looking at your heart, the condition of your heart. Now, it's not wrong to think that someone's attractive. It's like, hey, that person is very attractive. It's, that's not wrong to think that way. But it's when you pervert that, it's when you distort that, and it becomes lust, and it becomes desire, and you covet someone, that's when it becomes sin. That's when it becomes a wrongful thing to do. So moving on to the next commandment, because we're running out of time. Um, the next commandment, the eighth commandment, is you shall not steal. And so when we dive deeper, it's talking about greed. And greed is the heart behind you even beginning to think about stealing or taking other things. And, and greed disrupts what God has provided you as good, as sufficient, and saying, no, that's not enough. But clearly in 1 Corinthians 6.10, it says, Nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And so greed doesn't just end with the action of taking something, but it's also the inaction. And so when you, when you take something that's yours, but you take it without working towards it, and you just basically waste it away because you got it for free, then that's also considered greed. And also the very important discipline of tithing. Everything that we have, God gives to us as a blessing. God gives to us to provide for us. And so when we don't give, when we don't give back to God what is rightfully his, then we're stealing from him. And so when we look deeper into that, again, we're looking at our heart. We can see this in the very... or. I guess, I'm not sure if it's famous, but the passage about the widow's offering in Mark 12, the widow, when providing her offering, she only offers what's worth one penny. And everyone else is offering, their offerings are extravagant. They're large sums. But Jesus says in verse 43, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty has put in everything she had all she had to live on so we're looking here it's it's not just necessarily about stealing or taking things but it's about our heart where our heart condition lies and so if we dive a little deeper into that i think this commandment is saying you need to pursue a spirit of generosity that we should offer our things to others our brothers and sisters especially if they're in need so that we can provide for them when we see this in the early church in Acts, they offered up their things, they sold their things, not necessarily to make money, but the fact that they had brothers and sisters who were in need and they want to provide for them. So, moving on, commandment number nine tells us not to bear false witness against our neighbor. So to provide just a little bit of context, normally we understand this commandment as just not to lie, but this commandment specifically says not to bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, this was because back in this context, when there were trials and courts going around determining whether you were innocent or guilty, the main evidence that was provided was witnessing. And so if there were two people that said, oh, this person's guilty, but the man himself was innocent, then he was deemed guilty and killed. And so by you witnessing falsely, you had the potential to kill an innocent man. That's why this commandment is so um, important. But for us... Um, I think in a more modern context, I think for us, it speaks about gossiping and slander. And so for us, gossiping isn't just about saying false things about someone behind their back. But I think it even goes far as to say that if you say true things about someone, but that are bad of them, then I think you're also gossiping too. Because you're bringing down their character even though, oh, I'm telling the truth though. But you're bringing down their character by saying terrible things about this person even though they are true. And slandering, you're so biased against this person 
that you are not giving them a chance at all. And so you're completely devoiding them of any chance and saying, nope, that person is always wrong and that person is never innocent. Um, and so, again, this commandment, if we dive again deeper, I think it's saying we need to love our neighbor because if we don't love our neighbor, then we're exposed to all of these things, to lie, to steal, to say false things about them, to be biased against them. But if we love our neighbor, then there's no way that we want to do these things because we're looking out for them. We want to encourage them, we want to build them up, and we want to bless them. And so as we're coming close to an end, we're diving into our last commandment here, the 10th commandment, which is not to covet. And the thing I want to make clear here is the problem is the fact that we want things that are either wrong or we want them in the wrong way. So necessarily, it's, it's not the fact that you want things that it's bad, but it's the fact that you want bad things or you want them in the wrong way. And so coveting means that we want other people's belongings for ourselves. So simply put, when we covet, we're saying, my needs are on top of yours. And when we do covet, we're saying, God, your provision, what you've given to me, I'm not satisfied with. And so what my needs are are above yours as well. And so we feel rather obligated, like, God, I should have these things. I should be given these things. And so that's when we start to... Um, just have the wrong heart and the wrong mindset. And ultimately, at its core, if we kind of think about it, it's the fact that we're idolizing and honoring ourselves. But it's not just about wanting other people's things. It's also extension to having things and being too possessive of them. And so if you have things that you can share with your brothers and sisters that can bless them, but you're like, no, I don't want to share it with them, I think that also falls into coveting. Because you who are blessed with these provisions, you're keeping it to yourself. You're saying, my desire, my want for this item, this thing, is higher than the ability to serve my brother and sister. And so again, I think this commandment, if we dive deeper, is speaking about the spirit of generosity. Um, and just to close, yeah, just to close, um, I think the Ten Commandments are essential to our faith because at the very forefront of it, it speaks light into our sinful nature. So it's not necessarily the fact that we sin specific sins, but the fact that we're sinful people. And so if we're honest, if we examine ourselves, I think we're really hesitant and we kind of resist the Ten Commandments because if we come up to them, we have to acknowledge the fact that we fall short to them every single time. The reality is that I always fail at these things. But God in his loving and perfect nature provides us Christ. Christ honored God the Father, but also his imperfect earthly mother. Christ does not murder anyone, but rather pushes us to reconciliation. And he goes further to take the death that we deserve and provides us life and salvation. Christ resists all the temptations in the world, which include physical temptations, but he remained perfect and pure and holy. Christ is always the faithful partner of the church. Christ gives his love generously, his unconditional love. Christ had false witnesses against him, but he always stayed true to God and God's character. And lastly, Christ's heart is always in a posture of love, unconditional love. And we see that through his obedience in the cross, the gospel. Um, and so the Ten Commandments are a gift from God to set us apart from the world, to set an example for the world, but he also provides it so that we have a better understanding of who we are as his people. Yes, we're broken, but God provides a way out of that brokenness by saying, yes, you are weak, but I've provided Christ for you. And so reach out to him and, and find salvation. And so Christ and God provides us a space of protection and freedom. It may seem like that we're trapped in a cage, but if we truly understand the heart behind these Ten Commandments, we see that these boundaries are set up to protect us, not to enslave and restrict us. And so um, we as weak people, God provides Christ and 
he provides Christ because Christ followed these commandments perfectly and he did them in obedience to God and on our behalf. Because he knew on our own abilities, we would never be able to fill them perfectly or even well, if we're honest. And so, just as closing, I think that the Ten Commandments are for us to live in a way that not only establishes our loving relationship with God the Father, as described in the first four commandments, but ultimately as loving brothers and sisters in Christ. So relationship horizontally with each other. And so, uh, let me close and let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you so much for your provision. I know in our honest hearts, we have a resistance to these commandments, to these things that you have set for us, because the reality is, is that we fall short every time, and that reality sucks. We don't like to fall short. We don't like to be weak. But Lord, we're thankful because of the fact that you have provided Christ for us. You have provided salvation for us. And so if we just cling to Christ, if we go to Christ, we have a way out of our weakness. And so, Lord, would you be with us as we not only reach out to you, but also that we would reach out to one another, to our brothers, to our sisters, as we are the church. So, Lord, we thank you so much for reaching out to us first. We ask now that you would help us to establish and to deepen our relationship with not only you, but one another. Thank you, Lord, in your name we pray. Amen.